are so excited that you've joined us today. I'm your moderator, Faith Rogers with DKB Med. Uh, you're in for a great presentation today with our excellent faculty who I'll introduce you to in just a moment. Uh, for those of you that may be joining us for the first time, welcome. And if you've participated in some of our over 150 webcasts on this very important topic, we do welcome you back. Uh, we've been developing COVID education since March of 2020. So over a year and a half later, we're incredibly grateful for the progress that we've all made in managing patients during this pandemic. Okay, here's that great faculty I mentioned earlier. Um, please meet Dr. Safo and Dr. Ahankai. Um, thank you both of you for taking time out of your busy practices to be here today. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks for having us. It's a pleasure. These are our faculty's disclosures. Um, and this educational activity is supported by an independent educational grant from Merck. Um, all activity content and materials have been developed solely by the planning committee members and our faculty presenters. Our learning objectives today are to assess the impact of COVID-19 on Black, Latinx, and American and Indian in Alaska Native communities and the factors contributing to health disparities in these communities, to describe the current and potential management strategies for mild to moderate COVID-19, and to describe current management strategies and identify potential treatments for COVID-19 requiring hospitalization. Um, please do take note that the material presented in this program is current as of November, or November, December 13th of 2021. Uh, so if you're watching this on demand, please do um, look at the NIH and IDSA guidelines for the most contemporary guidance. I will hand this off to Dr. Safo to start us off. So Dr. Safo, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. So it's wonderful to be here with you all today. And we just wanna start with kind of contextualizing where we are with COVID. And this quote, I think really does um, get us there from colleagues from um, Perlman. It says, COVID is a funhouse mirror that is amplifying issues that have existed forever. People are not dying of COVID. They're dying of racism, of economic in inequality, and it's not going to stop with COVID. And I think that that's gonna really guide what you're going to hear myself and my colleague, Dr. Hunkai talk about today. So just to remind ourselves of the clinical course of SARS-CoV-2, um, which has held pretty consistent despite the various variants that we are seeing, about 80% of people will have mild to moderate symptoms. Um, about 14% of those individuals will get more severe symptoms, such as dyspnea, hypoxia, um, and you'll see lung involvement on imaging. And then about 5% of individuals um, will be considered critical, um, and those are the individuals that we're seeing with multi-organ dysfunction that end up in the ICU. Um, hospitalization rates do vary by vaccination status. And so vaccines for COVID have really changed uh, who we see ends up in the hospital. Um, for folks who are vaccinated, uh, breakthrough COVID shows up about 2%. Did, um, for who, are, who end up being hospitalized are about 10%. And unvaccinated folks um, who are greater than 60 end up hospitalized about 18%. And so we, many individuals who are working in the hospital, in the ICU, will tell you that the majority of people who they see um, that are very sick from COVID uh, fall into the unvaccinated category. And so the clinical progression for COVID really does um, depend on your immune status. For those who uh, have an, a, a normal kind of immune status that are not immune compromised, the disease course is over about 10 days. Um, after about a three to four day incubation period, and we are seeing early reports that Omicron's incubation period is a little bit shorter, about two to three days, um, you have symptoms and those symptoms are Kind of flu-like symptoms with fever, cough, myalgias, dyspnea. For a subset of people, they will progress to have more severe symptoms, as we've mentioned, including hypoxia, respiratory failure, etc. And then a smaller subset will have ARDS um, before recovery. For those who are immune compromised, it takes their system longer to clear COVID, and it means that for those who are immune compromised, they are infectious with COVID and can, and can continue to spread beyond the 10-day course that we generally look at. Below this graphic, you can see which treatments we are using at which times, and I will talk about that in more detail, um, and we'll share with you um, as well when patients are kind of pre-hospitalization versus within the hospital. And so what are some of the things that we've learned with various study types um, to really help us to predict who will have severe illness? So we have multiple um, 
systematic reviews and meta-analyses that have shown that individuals that have diseases such as cancer, cerebrovascular disease, CKD, COPD, heart conditions, individuals that have risk factors like being obese with a BMI greater than 30, um, smoking status, type 1 and type 2 diabetes, and pregnant or recently pregnant individuals um, all have risk for more severe disease. And then cohort studies, case series, um, and then some mixed evidence are kind of also pointing at individuals who have um, conditions such as HIV, neurologic conditions, sickle cell disease, and then hypertension, asthma, et cetera, as also potentially being high risk. Um, when it comes to being able to qualify to get things like monoclonal antibodies, the individuals that you see in these kind of last, these latter two columns, uh, many of them would qualify just because it isn't totally clear what it looks like um, if, if they do get sick and what their progression to severe disease looks like. So even though the evidence is more for this category towards the left, we are really supporting uh, more advanced therapies for the individuals in the, in the right two categories as well. So let's start to kind of introduce, you know, where inequities really do, do fall into this. And so the COVID net surveillance data looking at over 140,000 hospitalizations found that most individuals had at least one underlying medical condition. And that's something that's really important to remember because COVID is more severe if you have a chronic medical condition um, and, you know, be having a BMI of over of over 30 is considered something that puts you at increased risk, and we know the rates of this are very high in the U.S. If you look at the graphic to the right, the, the yellow line that you see that crosses, um, or the orange line, depending on your color palette, um, is uh, is the, the, the white American reference. All of these other groups are minor, historically minoritized groups that have at least, um, and you can see it here, the majority um, ranging from about 80 to 90% have at least one underlying medical condition. And you can see the rates of hospitalization, the rates of ICU admission, and the rates of death compared to each other, but also compared to the to white Americans reference group. And this is particularly high in the American Indian, Alaska Native, um, Latino and black uh, populations. And so there is a real need for us to understand what is driving that. And if you think back to the initial quote that we discussed, it's really a reflection of some of the underlying structural inequities that have persisted um, in this country for a very long time. And so kind of just, you know, seeing it in simple numbers, there's one death among Native Americans in 240 people. For Hispanic, that's one in 390. For Black Americans, that's one in 480. And that number goes up quite a bit for Asians and whites to one in 1,300. And so that difference is remarkable. Uh, just last week or early this week, there was a report from the Times, I believe, that talked a little bit about the lasting impact of these deaths. And it found that children of racial and ethnic minoritized groups account for about 65% of those who have lost a primary caregiver from this pandemic. And so this will have generational impact down the line for groups that are already historically disadvantaged. So let's talk about the treatments um, and what we can do and how we can kind of intercede. And so one of the things we always start by kind of speaking about since COVID is still running rampant in many of our communities is what we do in the ambulatory setting if someone is healthy, um, is infected with COVID and has to isolate. So if you're someone who has COVID, um, you will isolate for at least 10 days from symptom onset. There's sometimes questions of whether it's from the test positivity or symptom onset, it is symptom onset. Um, and you'll make sure that for at least 24 hours, you've had a resolution of uh, fever without fever reducing medications and the symptoms have improved. For those who are in close contact, um, the recommendation was 14 days. It has now decreased because of vaccination status. Um, that it can be uh, as little as seven days uh, with a negative test, and then obviously symptoms throughout. And I want to just really emphasize that throughout all of this, although we'll talk about vaccines, monoclonal antibodies, and other therapeutics, therapeutics, masking as a treatment modality is incredibly important for being able to stem the, the spread of COVID-19. And so what are some of the antibody-based therapies that we can use in the outpatient setting? So what we'll do is we'll go through the classic trials that have been done. We'll talk about EUA approval, and then we'll talk about some of the newer therapeutics that are coming out. And so um, in the BLAZE, uh, one randomized control trial with bemlanivimab and edizetimab, um, they looked at 769 patients in this phase three study. 
And these are patients who had mild to moderate COVID-19 with some risk factors for progression to severe, severe disease. Um, they looked at a dose of about 700 and 1400 milligrams for BAM and atazabamab, uh, respectively. Um, and when that was administered to individuals within this kind of 10-day period, they found that there was an 87% risk reduction, hospitalization, or death for those who received this cocktail. Um, it was initially stopped in June because there was a question about what was going on with all the variants at that time. And then it was the, uh, the uh, FDA EUA approval and kind of redistribution has since resumed since then. It is now authorized for all ages over 12, um, excuse me, from birth, and it's effective, um, which was effective through 2021. And the kind of 12-year-old mark is something that you should keep in mind for some of the other cocktails that we will talk about. So this is really one of the mainstays of therapies that are being used. The next one is casarivimab and indevimab, uh, which is a cocktail that um, was tested with two doses in a phase three trial of about 4,000 individuals. About 58% of these who were entered into the trial were obese and about 36% had um, cerebrovascular disease. 35% were Hispanic and about 5% were black. And what they found is that for the lower dose, there was a 71% risk reduction in hospitalization and death, which is the marker that folks are often looking at. Um, for the higher dose, it wasn't that much better. And so what's recommended in order to reverse adverse um, side, um, uh, you know, adverse effects is actually to go with the lower dose. And that has been approved for the 1200 milligram dose that can be administered. It can also be administered subcutaneous. And that's important because one of the barriers for access for monoclonal antibodies is that it has to be IV administered in a setting where you can be monitored. And so therapeutics that are IM or subcutaneous that allow for faster administration without having to be in infusion, infusion centers could really help with um, being able to get these to the high risk populations. But for now, um, th this is what we have. The third cocktail, oops, the third cocktail is sotrovimab, which um, was evaluated in a phase three trial with about 500 patients. In this patient population, about 63% were obese. 63% um, were uh, identified as Hispanic and about 7% identified as black. Um, Sotrovimab works by blocking viral entry and clearing infected cells uh, to decrease the amount of SARS-CoV-2 in um, a person who is given this medication. Um, it is active against Omicron variant, which matters a lot. Um, and this got EUA approval in 2021 because it showed an 85% risk reduction for hospitalization and death for those who received it. Um, and there's now efforts being done, as I mentioned earlier, to see if there's different formulations that can be given just to facilitate how easily we can get it to folks. And so those are the study settings that these medications were evaluated in. Then there's the question of what happens in the real world? How effective are they? And so um, this study in fe from February 2021 in an urban population of about 500,000 people, about 55% um, of them were identified as non-white non um, with a socioeconomic poverty rate of 23.4%. These were individuals who visited an outpatient clinic setting and um, were administered, about half of the 598 patients were given monoclonal antibodies with bemlinivimab, and the other half were not. And it was found that for those who are given antibody treatment, especially earlier on, when you adjusted for age, gender, and other comorbidities, the risk of ED, hospitalized, ED visits or hospitalization was 82% lower in the treatment group, which is tremendous in a real-world setting. Um, and that has real implications for both health, but also for capacity, as we're seeing a lot of these health systems get overwhelmed with many, many sick patients. And so that really brings us to this place with these three therapeutics where casarivimab, indevimab, femlinivimab with etazevimab, and then citrovimab are really being recommended as treatments um, for outpatient settings. And this is for high risk, individuals who are considered high risk, and I'll go through who those individuals are, 12 and older. Um, as we noted, bemlinivimab with etazevimab is approved for all ages. You want to get it within 10 days of symptom onset. Earlier is better. We cannot overstate this point enough. Earlier is better means that the testing that's recommended and access to testing is so key. We know that among certain groups, usually historically um, marginalized populations of racial and ethnic groups, their testing tends to happen later. So their access to these medications also tends to be kind of activated later. But the earlier, the better. Uh, patients have to be monitored, and they have to be monitored within a clinical setting in case there is a severe adverse reaction. 
And so who are, what is considered, you know, potential for severe um, disease? And so these are some of the individuals that we talked about before. Individuals who are older, BMI greater than 25, individuals who are pregnant, have diabetes, type 1 or 2, chronic kidney disease, have some kind of immunosuppressant um, disease or take immunosuppressive treatment, um, cardiovascular, lung, sickle cell, neurodevelopmental um, diseases. And then some of this is also due to um, evaluation by the healthcare uh, provider about, you know, your, your kind of overall risk given multiple conditions. And so these are the folks who are really going to go to the front of the line for what is still currently a limited resource. This recommendation comes from both NIH and IDSA. There was some from IDSA um, evaluation for variant um, differences, and, and there is a recommendation that if you can understand the way that these therapeutics work um, for the local variants in your area, that you may want to choose one over the other. That isn't from what I've seen being done as much. It's more what's available to be given to patients, but it is worth noting that that is part of the recommendation. And so what about other uses? Instead of just, you know, when you've gotten COVID and we're trying to treat you so your course is less severe um, and you're less likely to go to the hospital, what about post-exposure and then pre-exposure prophylaxis? So post-exposure prophylaxis, there was a study done in about 1,500 individuals um, of individuals who lived in a household with someone who had just tested positive for COVID. And of the 1,500 people they looked at, about 41% were Hispanic, 9% were Black. And people were randomized to either get uh, casirivimab and indevimab um, or not within about 96 hours of someone in their household testing positive for COVID. And what they saw, and I'll take you to kind of the symptomatic uh, group on the right, what they saw is that people, um, that there was an 81% uh, decrease or risk reduction, excuse me, in those who ended up having symptomatic COVID. And that's important because um, that's a pretty tremendous prevention. You know, it's a pretty uh, tremendous decrease in the time. Um, and then what they also saw is that people who ended up getting COVID, even despite getting this cocktail, were were sicker for were sick from a much shorter period of time. And so they ended up being sick for only about 1.2 weeks versus people who didn't get the cocktail who were sick for about 3.2 weeks. And so the EUA was expanded for this, for those who are not vaccinated or have an inadequate response to the vaccine, who have spent time with someone who has COVID and that's considered um, less than six feet, uh, 15 minutes uh, at least um, over a 24 hour period. And this is for 12 and up. And so this is something that's you know being added to kind of the toolkit for what we can use if you've been exposed and you're high risk. Bemlinivimab and etazivimab was then tested in individuals in a skilled nursing facility that looked at about 966 individuals in the BLAZE-2 trial. Folks were uh, randomized to get bemlinivimab. And what they found is that individuals who, that residents who were given BAM um, in the time where there was kind of COVID in the facility had an 80% risk reduction of being symptomatic um, through day 57. Uh, again, for a group that's very, very high risk, this risk reduction is a very big deal if you think about the kind of burden of disease that, that it is avoiding. So the EUA for this cocktail was ex uh, expanded in September to also cover these individuals. And then casirivimab and endevimab was tested in hospitalized patients in the recovery trial. And the question here was, for those who are being treated who are clearly already sick from COVID, is there any benefit to monoclonal antibody use? So this was an open label trial where casirivimab and endevimab was added to standard of care um, and most individuals were receiving corticosteroids. Most individuals had been sick for about nine days at least. One of the things to note in this is that the, the findings are kind of mixed, but they found that for those who were admitted for COVID, who were hospitalized, so obviously they, they were sick enough, at the time of enrollment in the trial, if that person was seronegative for active COVID at that time, and so they just, they weren't kind of shedding enough antigen to be able to pick up on testing, those individuals who were seronegative at enrollment in, in trial did better if they were given casirivimab and endevimab compared to those who were seronegative who were not given. It was statistically significant in terms of 28-day 28, um, 28 mortality. However, the overall population, so when they combined the numbers and looked at those who were seronegative and those who were seropositive and kind of looked at the com combined numbers, it was, not, it was not significant in terms of reduction in death. And so these, these data are somewhat mixed and there's still kind of evaluations being done to understand how best to use this therapy among this population. And then we enter this space where I think there's been a lot of conversation about new antivirals that are being released um, to help with treatment after exposure to COVID. And one of them is molnupiravir. Um, 
which is currently under FDA approval. It has been approved in Europe for use for folks who have COVID within the first five days of, of infection. The data for this were about 1,400 patients in the outpatient setting that had at least one risk factor for severe disease. Most were in middle age, about 43 years old, about 70% were obese. And what they found is uh, they did a randomized control trial and gave individuals uh, the medication within five days of um, excuse me, within within five days, three to five days of being infected um, and, and those who did not get it. And they compared the two groups. And what they found is that within five days of, of symptom onset, those who were given um, molnupiravir were found to have a 30% risk reduction in hospitalization or death. This number might be strange to some because I remember when this came out, we all heard 50% is the number. That was the number from the interim analysis. Um, the kind of final analysis that's been completed has shown that it's closer to 30%. Still, it's been approved um, in Europe for use, uh, and we're evaluating it for use here. The key for molnupiravir is that you have to be tested um, early. Um, and unfortunately, we're finding in some parts of the US, certainly in New York right now, it is taking up to five days for people to get their PCR test back. And so this kind of gets us back to the place of prevention and vaccination remains so key, because if we can't get you tested, we can't get you these medications when you need them. And then there is a new agent, um, and I'll use the name that most of us probably know it by, which is Paxlovid, which is um, a therapeutic that is a combination medication. About 1,200 individuals with severe, with at least one risk factor for di severe disease were evaluated, and they were given medication in this randomized controlled trial. And what they found is that individuals who were given medicine, the sooner they got it, it's a similar theme, the sooner these individuals got um, this, this uh, therapeutic, the lower their chances were for hospitalization or death compared to placebo. And that's 89% if you were given the medicine within three days. Um, and then it went down to 85% if you were given the medicine within five days. Really pretty tremendous results. And so we're evaluating to see when this comes on market and how it can be used. I want to mention one more thing before I turn it over to my uh, colleague, which is thinking about a therapeutic for pre-exposure prophylaxis. And so who would be the kind of folks who would use this? These are individuals who cannot get vaccinated or haven't mounted an appropriate response to being vaccinated, um, who are high risk if they get COVID. And the idea here um, is, to, is to test um, and this therapeutic is tixagevimab and silgabimab, um, which you guys might know as Ebuchild. Um, and it, is, it was really to test what would happen if we were given these cocktails to prevent COVID transmission. So uh, 5,100 uh, unvaccinated adults were evaluated. About 17% were Black, 15% were Hispanic and Latinx, 40% um, were obese, which is uh, the kind of risk factor there. And they found that risk reduction for symptomatic COVID went down by 77% for those who were given this therapeutic. And um, and the way that it kind of it works is that you're given tixagevimab and silgavimab um, one after the next in quick su succession, and that that protection lasts for up to about six months. So again, it's the same group of 12 and up who are high risk for COVID who cannot sustain getting a vaccine or the vaccine hasn't worked that will probably be able to, to get this therapeutic. So I'm going to, um, I'm happy to take questions as needed, but I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague. Great, thank you so much. So um, that was an excellent summary of the things that are available currently for pre-exposure prophylaxis um, for treatment for symptomatic patients who are not hospitalized but are at high risk for complications from COVID and for post-exposure prophylaxis. And now we'll be shifting to those about 20% of patients with more severe disease who end up um, hospitalized with their COVID-19. So this is a nice overview slide from the NIH summarizing their recommendations for treatment. And it really highlights here that there are a couple of branch points to keep in mind for hospitalized patients. And first, there are the group of patients who are hospitalized, but um, do not require supplemental oxygen. And so those, those patients may just require symptomatic management, um, not enough data to really support remdesivir in that group. And we'll go through all of the data to support these guidelines. The next group are those who do require supplemental oxygen, but not a high amount, so not high flow oxygen. And these are the group, these are the group of patients in which we'll be pulling for remdesivir and dexamethasone. The next branch point to think about is those who are having an escalating oxygen requirement, 
requiring high, a high flow device or non-invasive ventilation. This is where we'll pull the next class of medications, including baricitinib or tocilizumab. These patients are really likely representing those, those individuals who are developing a robust inflammatory response to their SARS-CoV-2 infection. And a lot of their complications are being driven by the, that inflammatory response. And then the next group of patients, of course, are those who uh, then require invasive mechanical ventilation or ECMO and who are, are the sickest um, in the ICU. So we'll, we'll go through um, the data to support these guidelines now. So um, starting with the uh, ACT-1 trial, which is a study that looked at uh, randomizing individuals to remdesivir and placebo, this was the first kind of uh, a treatment option we had available for inpatient management. And you can see um, on this slide, the, the blue line um, are those who got remdesivir, the red line are those who got placebo. In panel A, you can see that there's an overall improvement in the proportion of patients who recovered. This looked at the outcome of, of time to recovery. Um, and then if you look at the panels on the right, the other one that stands out is panel C, which is uh, the subset of patients who were receiving requiring oxygen. So um, these findings of improved outcomes in remdesivir were really driven by um, those patients who were receiving requiring oxygen, but not um, through high flow or mechanical ventilation. So it's those patients who are hospitalized with COVID and receiving um, uh, lower levels of oxygen who have the most uh, benefit from remdesivir. And I think this picture is worth a thousand words to, uh, to remember where the benefit is for, for this agent. Now, um, moving on to dexamethasone, and this is a, a landmark uh, study from the recovery trial um, that looked at um, over 6,000 patients who got, uh, who got dexamethasone versus usual care. This study was actually halted early because of the tremendous benefit that was seen. Um, and it was the first drug that we have that actually showed mortality benefit to, to individuals. And you can see uh, from the graphic on the right um, that, that overall individuals who received dexamethasone in the purple um, had a lower 28-day mor mortality. That difference was much more robust in individuals who were more ventilated. Um, and, but also we saw uh, that benefit in patients who were receiving oxygen but not ventilated. You can see below the risk reductions um, associated for each group. Importantly, individuals who were not on oxygen did not show this benefit of dexamethasone. In fact, there may have been a trend towards worse outcomes, worse mortality outcomes at 28 days in this population. So moving on to um, tocilizumab, um, this was also studied in the recovery trial. Um, tocilizumab um, is a monoclonal antibody that works against interleukin-6. This is uh, uh, a, a, an interleukin that is re released in response to infection and stimulates these really robust inflammatory pathways as part of an acute phase response. And so tocilizumab does um, target the IL-6 receptors. Um, and so this study uh, looked at randomizing um, people to tocilizumab versus usual care. Importantly here, most individuals were on steroids um, and some required uh, non-invasive ventilation, non -invasive ventilation, some had no respiratory support. The important thing for, um, for tocilizumab is that um, these patients were uh, requiring oxygen and had evidence of this robust inflammatory response with an elevated CRP. Um, and you can see from the data on the right um, with the, uh, that there was improvements in 28-day mortality. Um, there were improvements in tocilizumab in the purple um, in fewer people progressing to invasive ventilation or death, and then an increase in the proportion of, of patients who made it to a uh, discharge at 28 days. So um, showing the benefit of tocilizumab again in patients who had um, severe disease with hypoxia, high inflammation, and who were being treated 
uh, with systemic corticosteroids. So this benefit was in addition to the steroid benefit. Um, this is a forest plot looking at um, multiple subgroups um, in this tocilizumab study, really highlighting that there was benefit across almost all of the subgroups that were looked at. Um, also, as Dr. Sefo mentioned, um, time to symptom onset is important for inpatient management as well. Most of these therapies are recommended for within seven days of symptom onset. Um, but you can see here um, the other subgroups listed. The other one of note is um, this, the, the corticosteroid use, as we mentioned, where um, the lack of steroid use um, may favor usual care. So moving on to um, baricitinib, baricitinib is an orally administered um, JAK kinase um, inhibitor, Janus kinase inhibitor, JAK inhibitor, sorry, um, which was actually predicted uh, for, for uh, using artificial intelligence to be a potential therapeutic. But it does inhibit a number of intracellular pathways of cytokines that are um, activated in this severe COVID inflammatory response. So there are two studies um, uh, summarized on this slide. The first is the ACT2 trial. Importantly, this showed um, improvement in time to recovery uh, when baricitinib was, was used in patients who were being treated with, with remdesivir, who required supplemental oxygen, um, but were not on mechanical ventilation. Importantly, this did not really um, evaluate the impact of baricitinib with steroid use. So ACT2 trial was really uh, benefit in time to recovery in patients who were being treated with remdesivir. The COVI barrier 2 trial um, looked at uh, patients being randomized to baricitinib, um, who also were mostly, 79% of them were on corticosteroids. Few were, were on remdesivir. So this was really looking at the benefit of baricitinib in addition to steroids. And the figure on the right there is really summarizing those outcomes from the COVID barrier two trial. Their primary endpoint, um, which was death or progression um, to, to high flow oxygen or, or invasive ventilation was not significant. But the secondary endpoint of all course mortality was very significant. And uh, the use of baricitinib was associated with a 38% risk reduction in 28 day mortality. Again, that's in the setting of being used with um, steroids. So um, that's a, a, a quick summary of inpatient um, management for COVID-19, or at least the, the um, antivirals and Im Im immune modulatory agents that we uh, call upon for treatment. Um, now we're going to really transition back to a discussion about disparities. And as Dr. Sappho mentioned earlier, you, know, you saw the data um, highlighting some of the really important racial and ethnic disparities that we've been seeing. Um, throughout this pandemic, um, and you know the importance of understanding what's driving uh, those disparities. So we'll we'll get into a little bit of that in this in this section. Oops, let me back up. So this is a, a really important and interesting study um, whose goal was to really examine uh, differences in COVID nineteen hospital mortality rates between black and white patients. Um, and to assess whether those differences really reflected differences in patient characteristics or in the hospitals in which patients, uh, in which those patients were taken care of. And so this looked at Medicare data, data, data from um, over 44,000 Medicare ben beneficiaries, 76% were white, 24% were black, older patients, um, not surprisingly. So when they adjusted for individual level characteristics, that was age, sex, comorbidities, um, income, where they live, zip code, et cetera, black patients had a higher odds of, of death or going to hospice, 11% increased risk. Interestingly, when they now adjusted for where those individuals were being cared for, that difference went away. So the increased mortality that was seen for black individuals was entirely explained by the treating hospital. So this is a really crit critical factor. They went on in this really, really interesting study to simulate what would happen to those black patients if they went to the same hospitals in the same distribution as white patients. And when they did that, they found 
that this differential in mortality outcomes went away. So really highlighting the importance of system level uh, uh, bias in how we may be treating our patients. So um, this is another study really calling our attention um, to health system factors that may be impacting um, racial disparities in, in patient outcomes from COVID-19 and, and, and quite frankly, from other uh, management of other processes as well. So this is a retrospective cohort study looking at the use of remdesivir and dexamethasone. We've talked about the, the important role of these, patient, of, of these um, agents in inpatient ma management. But this um, study from, over, uh, from 43 health systems in the U.S., over 100,000 patients with COVID-19, found significant variation and how um, these agents were used when you uh, looked at this by race. And so um, you can see that compared to um, whites, blacks and Hispanics uh, had a lower proportion of those populations um, that were treated with both remdesivir and dexamethasone. Um, of course, um, you know, suggesting that there may be some underutilization of these agents um, and cautioning that, of course, that, that these, that these hospitals and health systems had a variety of different pace, pace, patient mixes, drug access, et cetera, but it's still really striking to see that difference. So um, moving on from health system and hospital level uh, uh, drivers uh, and contributors to health disparities, um, let's talk about um, some other determinants of health. This is a nice slide that summarizes a number of different factors that may contribute to health outcomes. Um, here you see behavioral patterns, which may contribute 40% uh, to health outcomes, and we typically attribute this to the individual. Um, genetic predisposition, of course, we have little control over that. Um, social circumstances, 15%. Uh, healthcare, we've just talked about, and environmental exposures, excuse me, 5%. So a number of different ways we can conceive of um, the determinants that impact health outcomes. Um, this is another uh, really important construct for thinking about um, uh, what factors Im impact health outcomes. And this is really looking at social determinants of health, which you may have heard mentioned quite a bit um, in this context. And these are, um, this is one framework for looking at these looking at factors like economic stability, neighborhood and physical health, education, food, community and social context, and healthcare systems. So these all contribute uh, to impact health outcomes. One critical point here is that these are not necessarily at the, the control of the individual. A an individual may be living in a community in which many of these fact factors are dictated. And these factors are going to influence whether or not you know, you live in a community that has access to healthy food or whether you are, you're in a community with food des deserts. Do you live in a community that has access to green space where you can walk and exercise? And so people are really, um, uh, um, uh, you know, impacted substantially by um, all of these determinants that create the environments that they're living in, that create the health comorbidities that, may ha that they may have that then impact their risk for example, for COVID-19. So, so it's a really complicated web of social determinants here. And it's really important to think about, about this framework and not specifically um, that of, of, of an individual, which I think is a trap that, um, that many have fallen into. So I'll pass it back over to Dr. Saffo to talk uh, through these things. So I think Dr. Hunkai, that, that point that you've made about how a lot of those factors and social determinants of health are out of the control of the individual is one that's incredibly important. Um, it is why I think it, it forces us to, to think and talk about some of the policy and public health implications of decisions that are made and, and the ways in which they will impact certain populations more. We have seen it in COVID in um, probably the most recent um, ways is through who is taking up vaccines. Um, and there's a lot of conversation that's happened with vaccine uptake around people who are not believing in the intensity of the pandemic or who are anti-vax. But it's also important to note that for the very reasons that were mentioned around social determinants of health, there are also some structural barriers that have been in place. And so these data from through November show the differences in vaccine uptake among different 
racial and ethnic groups. And you can see that about 50% of the overall population of black Americans in this country have gotten uh, at least one dose of the vaccine compared to about 58% of white Americans and Asian Americans are the group that's kind of the highest at this point. That number is interesting um, when you take a look at boosters. And so there's some early indication that um, some of the work that has been done to get individuals out to get boosts, um, to get their initial vaccines or their initial two doses of vaccines required trusted messengers and required community health workers and others going door to door and engaging individuals, um, Black and Latinx individuals to go ahead and get those initial doses of vaccines. And that as that decreases, as we have less of that push, that we're going to end up seeing less of uptake for boosters. And as you guys know, boosters are being highly recommended uh, across for all individuals um, 12 and up at this point because of what we're seeing with Omicron um, and the ways in which there is the concern that if you're not boosted, even if you're vaccinated, you may have uh, some breakthrough, some increase in breakthrough cases. Uh, the data that we have so far around boosters, though, is only for those who are 65 and older, and it does show um, for those who are fully vaccinated, for those who are fully vaccinated versus those who are boosted, that um, white Americans who are 65 and up are more likely to have gotten their boosters than Hispanic, Latinx, um, Black Americans. Um, and, and so, th again, these are kind of early data. I think as we start to look at data across all age groups, we'll see that that disparity of those who are getting now what is considered really a three vaccine series versus a two vaccine series is going to really differ. Um, and before we kind of get to the summer, you know, one thing that I do think is worth talking about is the impact that all of us can have as healthcare workers and people within the healthcare space and thinking about um, how we get individuals out to get vaccinated and boosted. And I'll, I'll ask Dr. Hunkai, like what you've done and, and what your efforts have been like to get people um, to answer questions and get people engaged around getting vaccinated and what some of the challenges are that, that you've seen. And I'm happy to share some on my end as well. Yeah, I think that, um, you know, this is a space where, you know, it's kind of, we've used multimodal strategies to really um, in, in, increase vaccination, whether primary vaccination or boosting for individuals, um, using trusted messengers uh, wherever we can, um, going out into communities to deliver vaccines to individuals has been critical, meeting people where they are. And I think being patient and persistent with providing facts not being coercive or not trying to be, you know, perceived as being coercive, um, using incentives where those work. I think it truly is, has been an all hands on deck strategy um, because not one strategy fits all. Um, and so I think, and of course we recognize that as we get higher and higher in our, you know, vaccine completion rate, it takes a lot more effort um, to, to increase those numbers. Um, but I think, uh, you know, really multimodal strategies is where we have found success in our region. I, I really agree with that. One of the things that I have found is um, the kind of need for a one by one approach. I have patients who have come in who very early have been like, absolutely not. We will not be taking, I will not be taking the vaccine. And yet over time, coming back and having those conversations and answering the questions, some of them have moved to a place of yes. And so it's really worth in an environment that is right now very political and charged and, and you know, there's a lot going on and a lot of conversations about those who are staunch anti-vaxxers. I do think it's important within our realm that we remember that, that you know, healthcare workers for, for the most part are still trusted individuals and the continuation of the motivational interviewing and the counseling and the talking down the line can really have an impact. So with that in mind, um, I'll summarize and then um, we will show you a, a video. Um, so in summary, we know that being Black, American Indian, Alaska Native, or Latinx is associated with higher risks of COVID-19 infection, hospitalization, and death. Um, and these risks are thought to be due to different um, conditions or where people live, work, gather, and age, known as social determinants of health, which we've gone through. And what is interesting is that um, there is the reality that, um, as we saw from the ASH study, that health systems themselves and where someone accesses treatment impacts their, their likelihood um, of dying or not from COVID. And so these, these factors, as we've emphasized, are sometimes outside of the personal impact and ability of the individual who is sick. We have many treatments for COVID as an outpatient, um, once you've been sick, and then um, as an inpatient 
monoclonal antibodies are available for those who are considered uh, at risk for severe disease or hospitalization. And then molnupiravir is a new agent that has about a 30% efficacy um, that's being reviewed here in the US for use along with a couple of others that we mentioned. And then just a reminder for the inpatient treatments, NIH guidelines for hospitalized, hospitalized patients include remdesivir, and it also includes immunosuppressants as well. Um, and the kind of recommendations uh, really do, it's dependent on the individuals, um, how sick they are and other factors that have to be considered. So I'll turn it back to Dr. Ahanka to kind of you know take us through. Thanks so much. So we're going to leave you with uh, a video um, out by way of background. Um, this is reflecting part of the story of Dr. Moore, who's a 52-year-old African-American, um, Caribbean-American physician with a history of sarcoidosis who was diagnosed with COVID-19. Her story really highlights some of the key things we talked about here, being a racial and ethnic minority with risk factors, a very high risk for, for, for poor COVID-19 treatment outcomes. But we're looking at risk factors of the individual in the context of a community and social determinants that are really being driven by um, structural factors. Um, that may be about the community and the environment in which a patient lives. It may be about the environment in which, in which they're seeking care. And so addressing um, these disparities really requires work at each of these levels. Her story is, is heart-wrenching. Um, you have two you know, presenters today who are members of uh, physicians who are members of racial and ethnic minority groups. And so watching her video from that perspective tells us that, that nobody is uh, necessarily uh, immune to some of these uh, effects, impacts of structural racism. So I will leave you to the video to close and then we'll take some time for questions after. This is the second worst day here at IU North. <clears throat> Yesterday, a doctor wanted to send me home. You know, at that time, I'd only received two treatments of the remdesivir. He said, ah, you don't need it. You're not even short of breath. I said, yes, I am. You don't qualify. I must have because um, I've gotten two treatments. He further stated, you should just go home right now. And I don't feel comfortable giving you any more narcotics. I was in so much pain from my neck. My neck hurt so bad. I was crushed. He made me feel like I was a drug addict. And he knew I was a physician. So I spoke to a patient advocate. If they're not gonna treat me here properly, send me to another hospital. Next thing I know, I'm getting a stat. CT of my neck with and without contrast. The CT went down a little bit into my lungs and you could see new pulmonary infiltrates, new uh, lymphadenopathy all throughout my neck. And all of a sudden, yes, we will treat your pain. You have to show proof that you have something wrong with you in order for you to get the medicine. I put forward and I maintain, if I was white, I wouldn't have to go through that. And that man never came back and apologized. And then today now, supposed to be getting the narcotics, right? They came in nine o'clock. I've been in pain since seven when they came in. Very, very sympathetic. Uh, yeah, we will get your pain medicine. He says, well, what pain medicine? I said, I don't know. I don't take them on a regular basis. I don't even write for them. All I know is that I'm in intense pain and morphine worked. Okay, well, we'll give you Percocet. It was another two and a half hours before I got the pain medicine. The nurse came in, and the first thing I said to that nurse was, why did I have to wait for so long? The nurse snapped back, well, you're not my only patient. I have five other patients, you know. I am a patient. Are you going to take care of me or not? And he went in. Now, that is not how you treat patients. So I don't trust this hospital, and I'm asking to be transferred. This is how black people get killed. When you send them home, 
and they don't know how to fight for themselves. I had to talk to somebody, maybe the media, somebody, to let people know how I'm being treated up in this place. And he gladly told me, I know you're a doctor. And he didn't want the black doctor to have no medicine, nothing. And then had the nerve to say, it's because of him, the nurse, that I got the medicine. How about it's because I had that stat CT in my neck where it showed all of that lymphadenopathy and, and infiltrates. Yeah, you didn't know about that? You didn't get that in report? Being black up in here, this is what happens. Wow, well, thank you so much to um, Dr. Safo and Dr. Ahankai for that presentation and letting us hear um, Dr. Moore's story today, especially in the context of all that we've uh, discussed. Um, we're going to move now into the Q&A. Um, please do know that I, I see questions coming in. Um, um, thank you for asking those to the left of the uh, slide platform. We will try to get to as many as time allows, but we don't answer them uh, today, please stay tuned for our upcoming webinars and we might just answer it there. Uh, so our first learner question today is, uh, what is the effect of psychiatric and substance use disorders on COVID risk or COVID outcomes? So I'm happy to take that. And so it is seen that psychiatric and substance use disorders is considered a risk factor and it's in part because of the kind of conditions that folks um, with those conditions may be in that may make it hard for them to seek care. It is part of the reason why that has actually been placed. Those two risk factors have been, have, are now considered risk factors for individuals to get more advanced therapies in the outpatient setting. Um, and so that question really does get at the uh, point that I was making earlier that yes, there are medical conditions that are listed, but there's also the reality of uh, mental health conditions or substance use disorder conditions that make folks at high risk, uh, which opens up the ability to really think about how we're treating them preemptively to avoid them progressing towards more severe disease. Okay, our next learner question. What do we know about how dangerous Omicron is in terms of mortality or even ICU admission rate? And I think this, we're still, you know, really actively gathering information about Omicron. You know, what we do know at this point is that it certainly appears to be more transmissible is more easily spread from person to person than even the Delta variant, maybe somewhere between two and four times that. Um, it's not clear that Omicron is more virulent, as in uh, that the disease course itself is more severe. Um, I think that you know we're, we'll know more, of course, with time. But but so far, um, that that's what we seem to to know from the data. And I would just add one additional thing to that, which is. Um, even if it isn't more severe, the concern comes from the reality that if more people, if it's more infectious and more people are getting sick, the chances, especially among the unvaccinated, of a subset of those people who get sick ending up in the hospital and in the ICU and overwhelming the healthcare system is not insignificant. And so um, if you're kind of wondering, why are we hearing that it isn't as severe, but people are super worried, that really is the reason, is that, it, that the numbers are not going to be in our favor if it is as infectious as Dr. Hunkai has mentioned. I, I, I agree totally. I'll just add to that, that you know we saw exactly that with the Delta variant. And because mm -hmm. of the way in which our health systems were so overburdened um, by uh, infection with the Delta wave, it, it actually made it seem like this was a more severe disease course. It actually wasn't, but it still had a substantial impact um, on our ability to deliver effective healthcare. Well, wonderful, thank you to both of you. I think to honor everybody's time, we'll have one more question and then send you on your way. Um, so this is our final learning question today. Is 10 days of dexamethasone still the standard or can dexamethasone be used for more than 10 days? Um, that is still the um, the standard treatment course. Um, um, if if uh, you know that's been studied um, uh, for for treatment of severe COVID nineteen, so um, deviations from that um, would be kind of not what was studied in in those protocols at this point. Okay, great. Well, thank you again. Um, for our audience, if you'd like to claim credit, please do click that claim credit button. It'll appear when the webcast ends as well. And be on the lookout for our 30-day survey. You'll get that in your email. As always, your responses will help us to develop further education. 
Uh, to our podcast listeners, please leave a rating and review on your podcast player. It only takes a few seconds and really helps us grow our channel and um, help reach other people with this important information. Um, and to those of us who watch us on YouTube, please like the video and subscribe to our channel. It's an easy way to show your support. Uh, so thank you again. We'll see you soon. Uh, Dr. Safo and Dr. Ahankai, thanks again. Thanks for having thank us. Take care.